I will just start by saying welcome to something to talk about from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. We are sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, and they are accepting residents. Learn more also about their day stay and respite programs. Call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's apartments on Rolling Bay. Also, um, the Senior Center is located on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, the Suquamish tribe, the people of the clear salt water. We honor them and we are grateful for their hospitality and we continue to work to engage with them to heal past wounds. Ableism in general is um, generally defined as discrimination or social prejudice against people with disabilities, usually because there's an unconscious belief that typical abilities or neurotypical, physically typical people are in some way superior or right. And it can be, it can be manifest as an attitude or a stereotype. It can be pretty offensive or it can be just unconsciously patronizing. When it, um, there's a lot of language that has been, uh, what would you say, kind of polluted in a way, like, people will say things like, oh, you know, my husband is emotionally crippled or, uh, you um, know, that guy's crazy, right? Or this is crazy cool or just so many things like, what a lame experience. Are you tone deaf? Or, you know, or uh, you're turned a deaf ear on blah, blah, blah. And it's like all these little phrases that are incorporated into our normal language, we don't realize how belittling they actually are until someday you hit the place where you're the one who's actually lame, or you're the one who can't really hear very well, and suddenly you've helped create a language landscape and an emotional landscape that really isn't uh, all that hospitable. And as we age, there's your link, as we age, we all kind of come to that place where we are differently abled than to what we yeah. had been in the past, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I um, find foot care a huge blessing, for instance, because A, I got arthritis in my hip and I can't get both my feet up anymore. And I can't see them when they're there, right? So it's like, okay, that's a huge change in my life. It's small. It's very moderate in effect, but it's one of those sort of landmark pieces of what I call slippage sometimes, like, oh, there's another little loss. And they are losses. They're real losses. But I think there are people, well, I know perfectly well, who um, have also internalized some of that ableism and feel like as we make the, as we discover those losses and we make those changes, our body has let us down or we can internalize anger against, you know, mm -hmm. feeling like we can no longer be who we were or do what we did. So I'm just curious about other people's experiences and how you see ableism appearing in your life or if you've been thinking about it, um, what happens when you get out in public with a walker, all that kind of stuff. Who's got a, Barbara? Yeah, I, I just have two comments. One is um, at my m former employer, you know, we had regular conversations along the lines of this. And um, I just remember how helpful the one was about ableism and mental health. And, you know, talked about the use of like crazy and nuts and stuff and saying crazy busy and someone with a, you know, psychiatric diagnosis talked about how um, off-putting that was. And, you know, it really helped me understand the need to be more mindful about that stuff. Um, and then the second thing is I have a young friend who's in law school who has a psychiatric diagnosis and she founded a disability, you know, students with, with disabilities. I don't know if that's the right phrase for it. Um, group. And one of the members came up to her and said, well, you don't look disabled. Um, and so, you know, there's the whole notion of uh, invisible um, challenges, you know, that people are struggling with and, and we don't see them. So we just presume they're not there. Exactly. I think I've noticed that both I have, uh, both of my kids 
have struggled with depression for years and years, and that's an invisible uh, disability that can be very, very uh, impactful on your life. And, you know, I was tempted to say crippling, Mm. (laughs) right? And there's another Mm -hmm. example of like how we have incorporated so many of those ableist terms into our unconscious use of language. Um, But yeah, it, uh, because you don't see it, it's one thing if you have a broken leg and you're hobbling around on crutches, that's, you know, but even that sometimes implies something that's temporary. It's another thing entirely to be wheelchair bound in a way that makes it obvious that that's pretty much going to be your life where uh, I know a number of people who have said, what I really hate is when people are overly helpful and they get in my way to open the door for me when I can, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. they're trying to be helpful because they see me as incompetent or incapable or helpless. Um, and that is an interesting piece too, right? Can we can be uh, really off the mark in that way, trying to be so helpful, right? But what's really helpful? Well, and I think, sometimes it's we have to remember to be able to accept some help sometimes when somebody gives it mm-hmm. or offers it when I was coming back this couple came up and they said let us help you with your suitcases and so I did and I chatted with them but it was you know hard for me to say oh I can you know that I can do it and so and I could have done it, but I would have struggled. So, so I was. I just said, "Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll let you help me with them. I really appreciate that." Even though I, you know, they could tell I was probably doing okay, or something. There was there that they figured that maybe I needed a little help. So, it's it's hard sometimes for us to be able to let other people help us or say that we need help every once in a while. Yeah, because it feels like a loss of agency. Right. It does. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you if I'm thinking back, though, at my age, I can remember people opening the door for me as a woman uh, or helping me to sit now as I get older, uh, asking if I need something out of the goodness of their heart. Um, be it a, be it a man or a woman, but let me say a man. Let me do it in this case, a man. Uh, that's the way people were taught back then, uh, and uh, at least in my where I grew up, um, we, we were we were taught to respect elders and to assist them and be there for them if need be, um, as well as other things to ask some questions and stuff. But um, I'm. I'm not put out by somebody opening the door for me because that's the way I was brought up. I think it's also helpful to sort of um, shift gears a little bit and view it as a gift to them because everybody likes to be helpful. Right. So uh, if they're helping you, you're helping them by saying, not shutting up and just getting help. You know, I mean, like, just don't make a big deal out of it. Just say thank you. Uh, but in but in your own mind, you've maintained your own agency and your own power because mm-hmm. it's like, oh well, I just helped that guy or that woman or that little kid or that teenager mm-hmm. or whatever. It's a it's a different mindset. No, you're right, Franc- uh, uh, Francis. You had your hand up. Um, on a lighter note, um, before I got old, <laughs> I still had the issue of being short and uh, <laughs> or to put it nicely, teeth. Um, and I have a hard time ask, still asking people to help me get something off the top shelf oh, in the grocery lovely. store. <laughs> and someone <laughs> said, well, you know, now that you've got a, I've got one of those grippers, um, but I have at home, I've had it for years. And they said, well, why don't you take the gripper with you? And then you don't have to ask for somebody. So I thought, well, that's, that's okay. So I tried that. Well, then I got even more help because <laughs> it, you know, it was a visible sign that I needed mm-hmm. help. So we were talking about 
well, you don't look handicapped or you don't look disabled. Uh, and then uh, on a more serious, not really serious, but an issue is if you look at um, people who use uh, disabled handicapped parking. And um, I have to say that I made the mistake of talking to a, a fellow uh, or a sister employee uh, that worked with me in my office and she was uh, parking in the handicap parking. And as far as I could tell, she had no physical handicaps at all. Uh, but she explained that she had um, fibromyalgia mm -hmm. and that she couldn't walk very far without a lot of pain in uh, one of her legs. And so I was very embarrassed uh, and I apologized. But she said, no, I'm glad you said something because I probably need to let people know uh, that I am part using the handicap parking and I, and that's why. And she said, I don't have no, uh, she told me, should I have no embarrassment about sharing it? I just never thought about it, you know, when I got the permit to use the handicap parking. But now I'm very aware of it. When I see someone who doesn't look handicapped, I don't jump to conclusions that they're just using it. Unless sometimes I've seen this, you know, $80,000, $100,000 sports car uh, parked and the guy hopping over the door or whatever. <laughs> it's, he doesn't want to get his sports car uh, scratched. I don't say anything, but having lived with a young woman, my, my daughter-in-law who died of Lou Gehrig's, Mm -hmm. I know how important it is that those spaces be available for people who do need them. Well, that's a really good point. Um, in effect, I know two people who give tickets, citizens arrest tickets, and call the police and take pictures of, uh, of the car and the um, license plate because they are disabled to the point that they really do need those spots and mm -hmm. are infuriated by that casual, well, the parking lot was full and I just needed to run in for a minute um, attitude. But Actually, when my late husband was, um, he, he had very extensive uh, prostate cancer and he had good days and not good days. And on one of the not too bad days, he had, and he had a handicap um, thing for the car, the danglers. And he, he got out and walked in and somebody from the store came out and said, is this legitimate? Do you really need this because you look pretty good? And he's like, thank you, I'm thrilled, but yes, I really need it. And I might not need it to get in, but I probably need it to get out. Like by the time I've walked around the store, I'm done. Um, but, mm -hmm. and it's another example of like, I need to see your disability if I'm going to believe you, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, you have to prove it somehow. Um, to, yeah, it just, it's a very interesting. And it's, again, that sort of piece of, uh, where do we, <laughs> where's what's, where are we being helpful to each other and where are we kind of butting in because it is helpful if you see somebody misusing one of those spots and reporting it but you know then you might be f making someone and your friend didn't feel ashamed or embarrassed but some people really do if they have to explain their disability right it's kind of putting someone in the spotlight there a little bit anybody else I'm, expe I'm exceedingly ex excited and happy about the fact that I've got one of those uh, tabs now. Uh, I, I, I have been putting that off for a long time, and uh, it was for COPD because I talked to my doctor about it, and she said, a long time ago, she said, would you like to get a disabled thing? Because you can't walk very far, can you? And I said, that's really true, <laughs> without puffing and huffing and puffing like crazy. And uh, she said look, I'll just write you a letter. So she didn't. And of course, with the fall, it makes it even more, more so obvious that I need something when I'm hobbling around with my cane. Once once the cane goes, I'm still going to be having that tab, though. And I'm grateful. For, I'm very grateful for it. Because when I get home from the Mariners at 1030 or 12 midnight or whatever, um, I'm so glad my car is right there and I don't have to climb a hill or anything. <laughs> yeah. I really am grateful. One thing I was pretty pleased about is at the senior center, the city finally got around to installing the no hands doors and it took COVID to make that happen. And that, you know, no hands taps and these things that really do make uh, 
make a big difference to the usability, especially if you do have a walker or a cane or are in a wheelchair. It makes it so much easier to get in and out of there when um, the door is not an obstacle in itself. Colleen, are you, um, did you want to share something? I did, I do. Last night, uh, some of us went out to dinner. We went down to docks. I'd been at a five-year-old great-grandchild's birthday party for several hours. We came out of the at dinner. I was really tired, and there was no place to sit while I waited for my daughter to get the car. Mm -hmm. Two gentlemen sitting in a four-seated uh, bench. So I finally said to them, would you guys mind letting the two of us, Barbara Cole was with me, um, sit there? And they looked up and said, oh, sorry, yes. And they got up and let us have their seats. Turns out they were visiting here to go to the Mariners game. They're hitting all the ball fields around the country. These guys were so nice that uh, they hadn't looked up because they were looking at their phones. But I think if oh, had they looked, yes. they wouldn't have had to ask. I think they would have done it. And that felt really, really nice. Yeah, it's sweet when somebody is thoughtful like that. And yeah, I hated to ask. I mean, inside of me said, no, don't ask. But I needed to sit down. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes we do have that feeling of kind of embarrassment or even a little shame that we can't tough something out. Uh, I think those of us who have spent many years trying to do it all and not need help, it can be <laughs> exactly. a kind of challenge, right? Yes, it is. It is. I um, there, uh, if you go to the the uh, Harvard Medical Center, uh, medical school has a series of. Um, tests you can take that are bias tests. Uh, and one of the bias tests is about um, physical ability or disability. And that's really an interesting thing to notice, like whether you, because um, when I first took that quite a few years ago, it said you have a moderate uh, positive feeling about abled people and but nothing, I was, it was neutral about disabled people. Well, now when I took it more recently, I have a much more positive feeling about disabled people because mm -hmm. I am one, right? And it makes, and I live with one. Um, my daughter is pretty disabled and has long COVID. Um, and it mm -hmm. really it changes your ideas, doesn't it? When it's something starts to be personal and in your real day life, not just an idea about something. Uh, I think for all of us, probably we're getting to that place where we're seeing that, uh, we do have to make changes of our own attitudes and sometimes our own beliefs about, especially like I was saying earlier, that feeling of your body letting you down, or if I had been a better caretaker to my body, maybe I wouldn't be blah, 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 right? Um, <laughs> I think we do have kind of a cultural tendency to blame ourselves or blame each other for not being perfect in many ways. Mm -hmm. Don? Six months ago, as some of you know, I moved into Winslow Manor, a, a residence for us older folks, active older folks. They like to use the word active. Um, and I had one of the things I've had to learn to learn is how or to, to offer and provide uh, support when I'm not sure people really are, are, are want, want it. Mm -hmm. And opening a door is one of those main things. And we have several residents who were in wheelchairs that have that seem to be having difficulty coming in and out the main doors because they're not active and activated in any way. You have to f physically push them. Mm -hmm. So some people like me to help with the door, and others people make it very clear that they do not want my help. So it's been a learning experience. Right, and reading somebody's uh, trying to read their body language of like. Or just saying, would you like me to help you? Or would you prefer that I just get out of your way? <laughs> right. Yeah. Reed just put the, um, the the bias, the implicit bias link for those tests um, on the in the chat. So if you're interested, you can uh, take a screenshot of that or capture it and, and try it yourself. Or really, if you just look up Harvard uh, bias tests, it will pop up in your, you know, online search pretty quickly. There's all kinds of them. There, it's really an interesting thing to kind of to uh, take some of these tests. I do say, however, that I think they're designed for younger people to some extent because part of how they judge 
your response is the speed with which you answer. And they have you like you're tapping an E key or an I key to say good or bad, positive, negative, able, disabled, but then they switch it up. And I don't know about you, but for me, it takes me a minute, right? And I have to be like, wait, which one? And now they have clues on top, but you still have to pay attention to four things instead of two things. Mm -hmm. And I have to say my reflexes are not what they were. So that may be skewing the bias a little bit too, right? Right. <laughs> I should point it out to them that, you know, their tests are biased toward younger people or neur neurologically, uh, T neurotypical people or something like that mm. yeah seems a little ironic yeah francis well in on that subject you know i find that true of a lot of tests or uh, surveys they give you multiple answers and a lot of them are skewed towards a younger generation in terms of the questions that they ask lifestyle and all or even just lifestyle uh i happen to uh have been as a child and then even as an adult moved a lot and uh, you know question will be uh, describe the house you grew up in is it you know how, yeah you know and it's like it yeah. should be houses because I had like 12 you know before I was 19 so right. I mean there are those kind of biases in all tests that assumptions we make and probably unconsciously just ba we do it based on our own experience and we create this questionnaire based on our own lifestyle sometimes or whatever. But it is, uh, it's interesting how our own experiences can shade or influence how we present facts or information to other people. Absolutely. And, and those, a lot of times those biases are completely unconscious to us. One of my friends is working on a children's book for children of, who have been traumatized and had very difficult things happen to them. Sometimes, because of their family situation. And yet um, some of the books that have been published for these are things like, imagine yourself safe in your mother's arms. Eh. You know, maybe that's not the safe place for that kid, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like looking at the whole, the, what are the, all the assumptions? That's really challenging, but it's actually great exercise. It's like, uh, like the language to say, uh, you know, that's so dumb. <laughs> means you can't speak really right or that's right. so lame or all those like uh negative they're, they're all meant negatively right and it does build up an attitude and so that was one of the pieces i've been reading about that you know we as elders have helped to create a culture in which being old is not really cool <laughs> for the most part right um and being not typically abled is often seen as less than. Oh, yeah. Actually, Barbara Golden, you are on. I was going to ask you if you would tell the story of the um, softball team. I don't know if she can hear me, but she had this great story. Oh, I hear you. Thank yes, you. I'll tell the story of the softball team. Um, this was a couple that my husband and I met um, in another country and they came to visit us on, on Bainbridge Island where we live and the guy who was older about our age um, he told the story of being in, he was the coach of a softball team and his team was invited to play another team in Cuba and he accepted and so they took a bus to the uh, to the field where they were playing and when they got there, the seniors looked at the other seniors and he discovered that they were calling them seniors, um, the, the team he was the coach of, but they were playing uh, seniors in high school. <laughs> because uh, they were seniors. And so he said, yes, we got off the bus and we looked at each other, both teams looked at each other. <laughs> And you can imagine what the, the high school seniors were thinking. Oh, we're going to play those old people. Anyway, they had a great time. And he said they were soundly beaten by the seniors, the high school seniors, but they enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> That's right. Like, what does senior actually mean anyway, right? 
let's see, Linda Fredrickson says, I don't think we need to walk on eggshells regarding language. Linda, do you want to talk and say this yourself? She said, even the word disabled is easy to change to differently abled. And that's right. It just takes, um, we have to re kind of retrain our brain, right? There's so many things that we're learning that we need to relearn about, right? And sometimes that stretch can be a little tricky, but that's right. Differently well, abled is a much more respectful way to say that. Yeah, I don't, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm having technical issues. Um, I think all of the language things can just, as I said, I guess I expressed it, not wanting to walk on eggshells, but, but being aware and, um, and it can just trip you up so much. I mean, um, that, but I, I do think as we've been talking in this discussion, differently able sure rolls off my tongue um, as opposed to disabled because anything that is dis is less than. Right, because dis yeah. is negative, right? Dis so I, yeah, I have a question um, going back to a remark that um, you made earlier and that is has anyone uh, how have people solved their own um oh perception how can i say this of, of themselves the, the, of themselves when they're using the cane the walker when they can't do something as quickly how can anybody speak to the struggle just the personal struggle of um, overcoming that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that internalized sort of uh, shame or embarrassment or loss or grief. Yeah. Do people want to talk on that? <laughs> no. Well, I, I, can, I can say something about, I know that I've been very, <clears throat> um, impressed with my dad, who is about to turn 95, who um, took to using a walker with almost uh, no uh, compunction. In other words, he realized immediately that he could move a lot faster, get a lot more done uh, with a walker than without. And a cane just wasn't cutting it. Um, it was still a very slow and kind of unbalanced situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, I know many people who are really reluctant to try to um, uh, use a device to help them maintain their balance or uh, manage their speed. Or like uh, um, we heard earlier from Colleen, um, one of the advantages of many of these walkers is that they have a place to sit. Mm -hmm. So you kind of bring your own chair with you. Um, <clears throat> which can help out in a situation where you find yourself standing much longer than you might like. Um, so I don't know specifically about how to overcome it. I look forward to the opportunity of my future to do that with grace. Uh, but I certainly have seen um, how it actually is enabling to not be... Uh, caught up in the in the risk of looking like you're not able yeah i remember that was very difficult for my mother who um did not want to have to use a walker but she really really did need it and she loved the chair that part kind of sold the ticket because when mm -hmm. she realized that she could turn it around and sit down when she needed to it kind of changed her attitude barbara it looked like you barbara oh yeah so let's talk about hearing aids um you know, when my mom was um, still alive, she had a significant hearing loss and would not even consider a hearing aid. So, you know, the television was on at maximum volume and conversation was difficult. And I, I think that that also contributed to her cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And my uncle, who recently passed, was the same thing. He would not get a hearing aid. And you know, couldn't, maybe he just wanted to hear himself talk and not listen to other people, because that's kind of how he was before his hearing loss. So I don't know, but I know there's, I have like a slight hearing loss, and I'm not ready to do the audiology thing yet. But I just think 
hearing loss and not wanting to get a hearing aid is still a big problem. Oh, you are so right. And again, I tell a story on my late husband who was hilarious about it. He, um, and hilarious is apparently one of those words we shouldn't use because some people have an emotional issue. Anyway, sorry. Um, but so I was, I had a little dinner party with my mom and Bud and another person. And I noticed that all three of them were having completely different conversations and <laughs> could hear each other. So I afterwards said, you know, I think you could maybe get your hearing tested. And he said, oh no, I'm fine, blah, blah, blah. But we went to Costco and he came out and he had what looked like a football thing. And he said, actually, it's really good. I don't, I just, I'm missing the high tones and the middle tones, but everything else is fine. I was like, okay. Um, but when he finally got the hearing aids, he came back and said, I didn't realize we had a PA system at work. And, oh, wow. And then he said, I hadn't realized how much I had stopped trying to hear. And I felt like that was really an interesting in piece that it is a struggle. I know that any of us, Reed, you were deaf for a week or two there. And any of us who've had, you know, ear blockage from stuff, you do hear the craziest thing. See, crazy. Um, you do hear the most unusual things coming out of somebody's mouth. You said, did you really just say riding a horse to Westerland? And they're like, no. But it, you don't... It, it's not like a crossword puzzle where you see a few letters and you can kind of sense out the word. When you hear fragments of a word, you don't, your brain does not make sense of it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And it can be very isolating. Reed, wouldn't you say that was kind of an interesting week for you? Oh, very much so. Um, and in fact, I'm still, I mean, I'm still sort of coming back into hearing the, I was sure I had COVID, Rita, but it was, uh, it was not, but it was a massive coronavirus of some type that blocked up my uh, my yeah. station tubes for real. And uh, I really could hear nothing. I have had, I have hearing aids. I have had uh, hearing loss. And I, um, it was sort of a, a ableism approach or whatever that, or ableist or uh, issue that made me get them. I was working in a work environment where my supervisor was on the other side of a, of a office carol from me and she would make comments and I couldn't hear. Her, so I was forever bouncing up and asking her to repeat, repeat, repeat. And I, and I felt like it was cutting me out of the conversation and I was interrupting the flow of the office all the time by having mm -hmm. to uh, ask for help hearing things. And um, so it was, it was fairly easy to and appreciative once I could do that. Um, and of course, hearing aids today, I mean, they're not cheap, but they are, um, they are very effective and they're not, um, I mean, mostly very effective. They're not, they're not like hearing, but, uh, in my experience, but, and they are tiring. The other thing that's kind of interesting about not being able to hear or, uh, maybe any kind of, um, different ability is often because we're trying to push to, maintain that, we get fatigued by spending the extra mental effort to try to compensate or physical effort. Yeah, it's exhausting to try to keep yourself in line with uh, some of my friends called the normies, <laughs> right? I mean, I have, well, I got a virus a few years ago, thanks to my beloved grandchildren, and it scarred the labyrinth of my inner ear on the left side. So I've had vertigo for three years now. Um, and at first, I don't know if you remember, Reed, I had to use a big walking stick. And this kind of goes yeah, to yeah. you, Linda, about like how to get used to it. And I would be walking around town and people would sort of say silly things like, oh, are you looking for the mountains? You're kind of too far away. Um, and I just thought, yeah, yeah. But that is sort of the assumption that if somebody's doing something unusual, they're odd or weird or trying to get attention or who knows what. Um, but it really has been a interesting challenge to me to have to learn to navigate the world knowing that I'm not steady and knowing that if it tip my right. head back I'll get vertigo um, for instance you really change up what you can do um, Rita knows this because we garden together and sometimes I'm like whoa you do that one <laughs> <laughs> you climb up there I'm so not going to again right um, but, but yeah. respecting your ability and your and your inability it's or your important. new uh, normal is kind of tricky sometimes Francis? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. 
Still muted. Uh-uh. Oh, there we go. Okay. There. Um, I want to urge all of you to get regular audio uh, audiologist tests. Sincerely, all the research shows that it affects your mental ability. If you don't hear, the brain uh, doesn't process. If it, if it doesn't hear a sound, it stops processing that sound. And it's very, uh, it's, it, especially as we get older, and the less sound that you are, your brain is able to uh, articulate or to hear and to understand, the less, uh, the less it, it work. I mean, it doesn't work as well because it's not hearing as well. So, so pretty soon it forgets those words and uh, it doesn't process them at all uh, the way it should. And that was a, a, a study done by, uh, Oh, I think, and it wasn't Harvard, it may have been Yale, it was a, but it was a legitimate, you know, well-respected research project. And uh, I know that myself, uh, I put off hearing aids or getting even tests, didn't think it was that big a deal. And then when I finally did, I was appalled at how much of my hearing I lost and how much I was trying to adapt. As was said, it's very fatiguing. And um, yes, hearing aids have come a long way, but they're still, um, I belong to an online group and it, it's just incredible how many of us still uh, have the problem with understanding speech in a noisy environment. Um, Especially with a mask, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah that, I mean, that's even worse. And, um, and captions can help, but uh, they're so, so often on some situations, they're very inaccurate. And they're hilarious. I mean, as you, I think you mentioned it. Some you say, did they really say that? Or uh, and then finally you figure out that it's, it's the captioning, and that creates another problem because the brain is hearing one sound and you're reading a different word, and so that confuses the brain. Yeah, it's very complicated, and you're quite right that mental health and emotional health are closely tied to being able to connect, right? And we know that isolation, social isolation is really harmful uh, in so many ways, physically too, and that uh, anything that we can do to keep ourselves connected is really important. Um, that's why we got that hearing loop in, in Huni Hall um, that really, that's been very helpful for a lot of people. Sheila? I think it's already been mentioned, but um, the cost is pretty prohibitive for good hearing aids. I mean, I, I, I price the ones at Costco, for example, to get a decent pair, to get their pair is about uh, $1,800. And I'm thinking, and I, I mean, it's more if I go to a smaller thing, I know that, but um, I mean. No, the, in fact, Costco is the least expensive provider of hearing aids. And they're good too, I think, aren't they, Francis? Uh, it's, it's very, uh, Am I still muted? No, you're good. Oh. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Costco is about half the price. And they're actually, they're sort of like Sears used to be where they carried Kenmore appliances, but Kenmore was made by Maytag. It just had the same, the Kenmore brand. Costco hearing aids have, uh, are made by two of the, of the world's uh, best manufacturers of hearing aids. There's, there's only really, three or four in the whole world that do quality hearing aids. Um, but yeah, I, and it's, it's been a real bone of content, uh, contention in terms of insurance because insurance doesn't cover it. Mm -mm. And then, you know, to me, it shouldn't cover it. I mean, it's a health issue. There's no question it's a health issue. Exactly. That along with uh, dental as well as vision, you know, all of three, all three of those should be covered automatically under insurance, but they aren't necessarily. Reed, did you have something? Well, I was just going to say that uh, that the AARP and other advocacy groups have been lobbying to um, try to include as part of uh, basic uh, Medicare insurance, teeth, eyes, ears. And so um, whenever you get uh, upset about this, it's probably a good idea to write a letter to your Congress people and senators oh. to remind them how important this is. 
Um, because <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I know that it's been a perennial issue, but it doesn't hurt uh, reminding them. No, exactly. Karen King and then Barbara O. Oh, hi. Um, I, I t Derek um, Kilmer recently talked about that that he is a big proponent and has proposed bills that have a hard time getting out of committee for to do the ears, eyes, and um, what's the other one? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and teeth. No, no, and, Karen. And, <laughs> I know, like memory. <laughs> I need it, but. Um, so yeah, it's, I know that Derek, but one thing that Derek Kilmer always tells me, he says, I know that you probably feel this way, but I still want you to contact me. Right. I want to know. And so, you know, email him, call him, call our state senators or, and, um, you know, and our federal, because that's really important because, you know, even though it's something that's been gone, you know, can't get out of committee or something, they still want to know. Yep. You know, they they don't live in a vacuum, even though D.C. sometimes feels that way. But and, and we have the uh, on the initiative I want to talk about a uh, whole Washington initiative. I hope that you've all had an opportunity to um, sign that petition. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox, but it's talking about single payer health care in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow. I'll get off my soapbox now. It's a good soapbox, Karen. Thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> Barbara, oh, did you have something to add? No. Oh, I thought I saw your hand go up. Sorry. Um, no, I think I was applauding somebody. I do want to thank Frances for her comments. Um, it makes me reconsider my resistance to audio <laughs> testing. <laughs> and it, it it tells me that I will go to Costco um, if and when I need a hearing aid. So thank you. Be, be aware, Barbara, when you call, which I did, I called last month, and the earliest I could get in was October. Whoa. They're busy wow. down there, folks. They're very busy. Okay. And that was just for a test. Um, Nancy, also, speaking of, speaking also cost, Barbara, let me put in a little, I went to Costco a while back, and <clears throat> the woman tested me, and she said, go home, you're not ready yet. So just because you go in for a test doesn't mean... Right. That you're going to come out with hearing aids. And I was so impressed with that, that mm -hmm. she had the the uh, honesty, you know, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a super duper plug for Costco. Um, and she's still there, the woman. So okay. and and ask, ask for her. Francis, what, what, what's, what's, what's her name? Exam a year. Sorry, wait a sec. Francis? Medicare pays for one audio exam a year. Mm. So, you know, that's what less expense, but it is the hearing aids that are so expensive. Not unusual. I paid, I have what's called a cross system because I'm totally deaf in one ear. It sends the sound from the from this side to this hearing aid. And that pair costs me five thousand dollars. Oh my God. That's not unusual. No. That's not unusual. You know, the hearing aid I when I called for Costco, the hearing tests are free. Yeah, those are free. They don't charge you for that, uh, for the exam. But uh, of course, they'll charge you for the if you if you need to get the um, the equipment they're on you, which of course is fine, which I understand. So I can hardly wait till October comes, folks. I can't hear a word you're saying, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd love to return a little bit to Linda's question about, you know, how do we adapt? How do we come to grips with that kind of internalized ableism or internalized ageism uh, where we really do feel embarrassment or shame sometimes, or how do we, you know, sometimes I hear people handling it with humor. Nancy, you've got yeah, some I, I'm a big fan of humor. And my thinking is we're just doing the best we can, okay? You know, and everybody cut everybody some breaks because some people are not gonna hear well, other people are not gonna walk well, other people are going to lose their cognitive, you know, it's all a part of whatever is our future. All right. And we're just rolling along doing the best we can. And um, I don't believe in shame, you know, telling my body, oh, you're letting me down. The body's doing just as best as it can too, you know, and you are stuck with it anyway. So you might as well be a good friendly team 
and have a positive attitude about whatever it is life is going to throw you. Um, so, um, and while I have a moment here, uh, going back to some of the phrases we all need to worry about, I was recently barked at quite severely for using the phrase okie dokie. So I'm wondering if anyone can fill me in as to what was offensive about okie dokie. Okie dokie is, 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 is a, um, it's an Eastern term that you and I both know. It's a what term? East, Eastern. East you Coast? have a Philadelphia, a Pennsylvania one. I have New Jersey. I said, I grew up with okie dokie. Yeah, yeah, yeah but what's, but it, 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 so now it's offensive on the West Coast? What are you saying? It, no, 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 no. Yo, you're, you're west of Jersey. I know that. But um, <laughs> no, you're from, you, you learned it probably from when you were a kid in Jersey, right? And, and in Pennsylvania. So. Well, that's not the issue. Why is it offensive? I, is I, it, that I can't tell you. Barbara okay. O has her hand up. Let's hear what Barbara says. Is it because it contains the phrase okey and that scene is, um, you know, patronizing way to talk about Oklahomans? Oh. I don't know. Francis, well, you had an idea too. What's yours? Um, this goes way back to the Second World War. Um, and um, it, I'm not going to say the whole thing, but it was an insulting kind of limerick. It said, okie dokie, no more pokey. Well, I'll oh. say no more pee pee in the tea. And it was a joke ending about a Chinese laundromat. And uh, no ticky, no washy, that kind somebody. Of and so I don't know how this became wow. popular, but that was goes back to 1950, 40, about 1946, that I was aware of it. My mother said, Don't don't say okie dokie. <laughs> and then she told me, and then my dad repeated the the lim limerick, the, the not the uh, silly poem. And um uh, my mother was mad at him for telling me that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness! Anyway, okay. that was my background. Was, That's well. funny. In Massachusetts, people would say "okie dokie artichokey." Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it wasn't exactly. anything. But who knows? You know, so, I so. also noticed that there are people who can get um, pretty upset about virtually anything. <laughs> well, that was my. Th That's my thing. So, how cautious do we need to be? And when that does happen. Is the proper, my proper response was jaw drop, you know, uh, what are you talking about? All right. So I didn't have the poise and the wherewithal to say, hey, tell me, what is it? Why, why is that bothering you? Which I know would be the next good thing to do. But assuming that we're not going to do that all the time, uh, I'm getting a little uh, spooked by how as my children would say, mom, filter it, you know, uh, because I do tend to be pretty direct and I'm old fashioned and, and I use some words that, that you know, okie dokie apparently isn't any good anymore or hilarious. And you said hilarious. You like, no, oh, it turned I out I was wrong. Hilarious is okay. It's hysterical. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. see, now come on, you, you know, know I, I, I cannot live my life like that. Okay. I mean, I, I let's not that that's not true. I choose not to live my life like that. If I'm going to offend, okay, get offended. And hopefully I will have the poise or, you know, the concern to say, hey, whoops, sorry, didn't mean that, you know, tell me what's the deal. And that's a great response. And, you know, but, I, I have a lot of, um, a lot of friends among the transgender community. And what I hear all the time is, you know, people say, things or ask things that are actually pretty um, inappropriate at times. But yeah. what I hear always is, you know, if I feel like they, it was a sincere effort to get information or just a simple mistake, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's being malicious, that's a whole nother deal, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if someone says, get out of my way, you old hag, I would probably, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Have a little that's, conversation. That's when you hope you have a cane. Wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I have my cane there. That's why I have my Darn. cane out for me. <laughs> right, uh, Anne. I would like to add something. Um, oh, well, I like what Nancy was saying about uh, humor. 
uh, recently I was diagnosed with irreversible vision loss. And then I started to think back to the times when that has been evident. And I was telling two of my adult children and one of them said, that's been pretty obvious. And I think she was responding to the time we were all in Bellingham for her birthday. And um, we were in a bookstore in Bellingham and I went up to a guy and asked him if he wanted to go back to the hotel and lie down uh, while, we were, <laughs> while we were waiting to go to the birthday celebration. <laughs> And he wasn't my husband. <laughs> so, so I was teased about that because everybody, you know, the grandchildren, the children, <laughs> they thought that was pretty funny. And I, it, it was only recently that I thought that was because of vision loss. I didn't recognize him. And when I took a close look, I, I thought, that's not my husband. And then I, then I started to think, he'll go home and tell his significant other and they'll say, nah, that didn't happen. You weren't <laughs> positioned in a bookstore. <laughs> so well, that's wonderful. I mean, in a way, but it's awful in another way too, right? I mean, now I think about it and I, and I laugh um, because I think it was pretty funny that I did that. And um, I didn't know the guy, so I'll never see him again. <laughs> well, you don't know that, Barbara. He may be on your trail right now. <laughs> yeah, but will, but will you know when you see him again? <laughs> I will <don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> Whoever you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did he respond when you said that to him? He didn't say anything, and I thought for sure he was my husband because my husband can't hear. He can't hear that well, and I thought, well, he just didn't hear me, so I said it louder. <laughs> <laughs> now we know all about you, Barbara. Cole. But I, but I do think I do think this is great. This is a evident of Nancy's suggestion of having humor about it all. Exactly, the yes. healing power of humor. And that really does go such a long way toward lightening things up. And you know, you're right, Nancy. That um, we this is the body we have, and consider you know, if we don't have it anymore, we're not really on the planet anymore, right? So yeah. when you say consider the alternative, that's kind of where we're at. I found myself sometimes apologizing to my body, saying, "Oh, you know what? I'm so sorry that I." knelt in the mud and pruned trees, you know, for so long and didn't pay any attention to how, what was happening to my arms or my knees or whatever, you know, you only get one set for free. Right. But it, <laughs> I also feel like it's, a t you know, there's some really healthy way to say thank you to your body. Like you've yeah. carried me so faithfully for so yes. long. And, yeah. and I really appreciate that, you know, as I'm losing vision and, you know, my balance is shot and blah, blah, blah. There's all this other stuff, but we're still here and we're still cooking and we can still find humor and warmth and we can still share. And one of the things I'm most grateful for is that we can talk openly about mm. things that like my parents would never, ever talk about. Mm. And I think that's a really healthy step forward that we have created a culture where we can talk freely about things that are maybe challenging or difficult or embarrassing, but we're in it. And what's more wonderful than hearing other people say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I hear you, right? That solidarity, um, you're certainly not alone. Don. Oh, I just want to say, uh, Anne, that you you and Reed have created an environment there that uh, makes it clear to me that it, I'm very welcome as a gay, gay person, for example, but that's not just who, I'm not just concerned for myself, but you've all illustrated here today by the fact that it's, it's having this conversation is just one, one, another way in which we've, we're made to feel part of, the, part of the senior center that I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Don. Right. Yeah, it's so sweet. And yeah, I'm grateful too, because I get to do this with you all and it's so enriching and so uh, uh, fruitful. And I think we all come away with some different ideas and some good stories. Thank you, Barbara Golden. <laughs> That's two, two good stories from you today, girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I think being able to kind of turn things around, look at our losses with, a, you know, a little humor and a little, oh, well, right? Those are great graces. 
And I'm grateful for all of you for showing up and having this conversation with us today. Thank you. And we are grateful for you, Anne. Thanks so much.